Okay, good morning, everyone. I think uh, there is already a good number of people connected. Welcome to this uh, um, academic training lecture series about robotic activities at CERN. Uh, this series uh, consists of five lectures. Um, today, the first lecture is given by Mario Di Castro. Um, now, I would like to introduce him. Dr. Mario Di Castro received uh, the MSc degree in electronic engineering from the University of Naples, Federico II, Italy, and then the PhD uh, from the Polytechnic University of Madrid, Spain. From 2007 until 2011, he works at uh, EMBL in DAISY in charge of advanced mechatronic solutions for synchrotron beam lines controls. Since 2011, he works at CERN, where since 2018, he leads the mechatronics, robotics, and operations sections. The section is responsible for the design, installation, operation, and maintenance of control systems based on different platforms, PLC, PXI, VME, for movable devices characterized by few micron position accuracy. For instance, scrapers, collimators, shielding, and target in harsh environment. Important section activities are the design, construction, installation, operation, maintenance of robotic systems used for remote interventions in the old CERN accelerator complex. His research interests are mainly focused on modular robots, human robot interfaces, machine learning, enhanced reality, automatic controls, mechatronics, motion control in harsh environment, and advanced robotics, also for search and rescue scenarios. Okay, so then uh, Mario, the floor is yours, please. Thanks a lot, Massimo. Good morning, everybody. So thanks a lot also for the invitation and to allow me to introduce the robotic solution we uh, have in our group for remote maintenance and uh, quality assurance. So as Massimo said, this is the first um, lecture of a series of five where we are going to touch design, controls, operation, maintenance, aspect tooling, and procedure around the robotic system that we use in our group. We will focus actually on the requirements, challenges, and operational constraints that CERN uh, presents regarding the accelerator complex. So today I will uh, talk about uh, general use of robotics and how we use te this technology uh, within our group. Then tomorrow, Eloise will be focused on teleoperation controls and optics. Then on Wednesday, Christophe will uh, talk about uh, how we uh, control the robots, how we interface with the robots and how we use the artificial intelligence to control them. Then Harness will talk about uh, robots, kinematics and design. And look on Friday, we'll close this series talking about uh, simulation and uh, best practices on the use of, uh, of robots. I would like to acknowledge and thank many, many colleagues that have support us I'm not listing all of them because for sure I will forget someone, but the work I'm presenting is uh, supported by many, many colleagues at, um, at CERN. So that's the content of my presentation. I will quickly introduce uh, robotics and why uh, we are using and which challenge we have, uh, we face to apply these robots at CERN. I present the robotic service that is within uh, the CM group, within our group. I will uh, show you some videos about uh, past robotics missions, interventions, uh, some future objectives before the conclusions. So we are currently in the, what is called Industry 4.0, where the robots, artificial intelligence, internet of things are playing uh, key roles for this, uh, for this revolution. And since 2011, uh, robots are entering uh, strongly in this, uh, in this uh, revolution, uh, thanks also to collaborative robots. These are robots that can help humans in doing, in performing, uh, in performing tasks. There are many, many definitions of robotics. What I like most is the, is what is written here. So what is the branch of technology that deals with the design, construction, operation, application of robots. Of course, a robot is confused by many, many parts. Mainly, there is a mechanical part, an electrical and electronic parts, and of course, a control parts. In this uh, diagram uh, are the main elements we have in our uh, robotics group. So what we do, we do mechatronic robot design. So this was from CAD, uh, in-house prototyping. 
we uh, control robots. So all the robots I'm going to show are controlled by in-house uh, control system. So we use uh, motion control uh, actuation, actuation path planning, but also an important part of the um, robots we are going to use are the logistics and the management of this robot. Because one thing is to control them, to, to build, to design, and, but they need to be brought on the field and uh, used. There are contamination aspects, cleaning, and so on. So uh, here I'm listing this type of robots just for uh, generic uh, knowledge. So we have articulated robots, it can be robotic arms in different configuration like uh, multi-axis, uh, SCARA robots, cylindrical or Cartesian. Then we have uh, hyperinduna robots or what they are called sometimes snakes robots, um, autom automated ground vehicles, so ground robots, humanoids, flying robots, drones, quadrupeds. These are also developed mainly in the last uh, years, but also soft robots made by, by different materials. If we list the robots divided by application, we have hobby or competition entertainment robots, industrial robots mainly done for repetitive tasks, surgery or rehabilitation robot for medical application, domestic or household logistic robots, the robots that are cleaning our houses, for example, military robots, and the robots that are used for space and service application. These are most of the time the most intelligent ones and are used for uh, mainly also for R&D. If we divide the robots based by the controls, so we have the teleoperated one, semi-autonomous one, and autonomous. Teleoperated are normally wired or wireless, depending on the application, and the autonomous can be pre-programmed or they can uh, they are self-learning. They can learn the environment and they can take decision during the different tasks. So when we, when we use a robot, we have to take care about different aspects. First of all, we need to take care about the remote, uh, the requirement of sorry, the working zone of the robot and the working zone of the operator. And as I said, this can be manual supervised or automatic uh, robots. Another important aspect in user robots, the human robot interface. So this links, the interface links the robot with the operator and they have a double main functionality. First of all, they report the status of the robot but they are meant also to generate commands to, to, to be brought to the, to the robotics on the field. Artificial intelligence is one uh, aspect that are uh, in the last days endorsing uh, our robots and in general, in general any robots. So this is the intelligence that is uh, exhibited by machine. So a machine is able to localize itself in an environment, to know the environment, to learn the environment, to take a decision during, uh, during a mission. And why is there is used machine learning in robotics? Mainly because we could, for example, uh, control robot in uh, an autonomous way. The robot, especially in an autonomous car, can uh, sense the environment, so can take decision, uh, can prevent obstacles, for example. But also machine learning is used, as I said before, in human-robot collaboration. So, for example, robot can help human in, uh, in doing tasks. This year, I put three videos of three humanoids that have been developed in the last years by different research centers. And the robotics community is strongly uh, investing in uh, machine learning uh, that can be uh, adopted to social robotics. So believe me, if you see this robot uh, at half a meter distance, they are really scary, but they look really uh, like humans. They are behaving like humans and they do human-like uh, actions. Many of you might see in this video, this is Atlas made by Boston Dynamics. It's a humanoid that can jump, uh, do many, many actions. And uh, actually it's uh, for R&D purpose. And this is uh, actually a spot. You have seen some videos maybe on YouTube recently. It's a quadruped also built by Boston Dynamics and they are, uh, go, they are selling in the last couple of years, many, many of these uh, units for uh, remote inspection but they are also equipping this quadruped with a robotic arm for a basic uh, teleoperation. But it's still a mystery for the robotic community because they are not publishing anything. And also Tesla announced, uh, I think last two months, the, they're going to invest heavily on, uh, on a humanoid for the, for the next future, of course, endorsed with, the, with artificial intelligence. This is a video extrapolated from iRobot, the movie from 2004 that they were, that who was anticipating actually how the robot will behave in 2035 and you have seen uh, Spot and uh, Atlas before. So we are not so far to, to, reach, uh, to reach this. But then if, if you see this, this has been uh, the DARPA challenge 
competition. It's a competition where uh, the most advanced research centers and institutes in, uh, in the world have tried to use humanoid in uh, normal tasks like working on the, on the sand or opening a door. And none of them has been able to, to fulfill uh, the task required. So this means that making this type of robot is really a challenge. And uh, why collaborative roles are not intensively used in the last year? Because they appear still, uh, still slow. So you see here an, an, um, a robot that has been programmed to help a person to, to lift a uh, weight. So you see that uh, the control still needs, takes time really to, to feel uh, what the human is doing and to try to help in a, in a, robust, in a robust way, the human, uh, let's say human task. Well, uh, robotic worldwide community is going. Actually, there's a lot of focus on social robotics, of course, autonomous driving vehicles, and uh, surgical robots uh, powered by artificial intelligence. In the use of robot, one has to uh, balance three important aspects, in my opinion. One is the interaction, one is the autonomy, and one is the proprioception. So when we use a robot, we need to know how to interact with the robot, OK? So, and normally, if you have, if you see these um, 3D plots where we have autonomy, interaction, and perception, telemanipulators are mainly the, the type of uh, robots that they interact with, uh, with the robot on the field. Then autonomy, many of the industrial robots are autonomous, and perception or uh, proprioception. This is the capacity of the robot and the operator to understand what's going on in, the, in a robot that's deployed in a mission. Here I plot a basic um, teleoperation system, teleoperation scheme, okay? We have the operator side uh, with an actuation device that can be a master arm on a joypad or a keyboard. And then we have some intelligence into the human robot interface. Then we have the communication channel. And on the right, the remote environment where we have a robot on the field that can blindly uh, execute the, the command from the human robot interface or can have some intelligence with some remote algorithms that are running on the, on the robot. Here I put an examples of eight year steps of teleoperation. On the left, there is uh, some uh, mechanical unilateral, uh, fully mechanical uh, master slave control made for uh, maintenance in uh, nuclear facilities. And on the right, there is the last development made by German DLR in the in teleoperation. So you see, we, we go from uh, unilateral master uh, slave mechanical device to a bilateral teleoperation system with active feedbacks. And the operator has also visual reality uh, in the headsets to move the, the robot that is doing actually the task in the remotely or uh, in the field. So in general, teleoperation university research center is uh, has done in the last year many steps towards forward, but they are still mainly test and uh, they are mainly test and prototype devices. They are not always designed to be uh, robust uh, and uh, in the industrialization concept of the last R&D Intel operation is not easy in many cases. You have a video here on the surgical robots on the left and on the right, another application from DLR, this is space uh, teleoperation uh, task. So you see here how a robot, for example, uh, on, the, on the earth can uh, drive some, uh, let's say, actuation in, uh, for, space, for space application. Here I put some example of how uh, teleoperation is used nowadays in big science facilities. For example, at JETS, you have some videos on, of some teleoperation tasks used at JETS, but also there are some uh, of these uh, master slave arms that are used uh, in other um, big science facilities. And in, in uh, most of these cases, you have a bulk installation in structure events. So the environment is really structured, so it's well known. The tasks are well defined. And for this task, you need uh, well-trained operators. So you have high maintenance costs. And uh, of course, for this task, the maintenance intervention time is extremely critical. What about an in industry? So um, I introduced the operation and there is an in industry, for example, for robot that uh, they build or paint car, there is no, no room for, uh, for the operation, basically. They need the quick and repetitive tasks. And of course, uh, this industry is a, a structured environment. And uh, most of the time, as you see here, for robots that build or paint a car, there are bulk installations and the tasks are uh, much, well, much well defined. 
So which opportunities we have for uh, robotics in the, last, uh, in the last years? So many, many people are saying that uh, robots will uh, overcome the effect of the, what are called megatrends. So they will help in fighting the aging of the population, the climate change, the urbanization, and they will help us in uh, goods fulfillment, for example, in construction, food production, uh, and manufacturing in, uh, in general. There is a strong ethical aspect, as you can imagine, in the use of robots. So many, many people are saying that they will replace us, they will take all our jobs, uh, many things that uh, they will make uh, humans unnecessary, or others are saying that uh, humanity, we are just a face of a robotic uh, evolution. For us, for example, we see that, uh, personally, I see that there is a strong uh, potential to use of this technology that can be beneficial for us. At the end, everything depends how we use them, okay? And for us, robots must improve the quality of work by taking over dangerous, tedious, and dirty jobs that are not possible or safe for us to be, to be performed, for us and for our colleagues, for sure. So I will uh, finish here the quick introduction I've done on, uh, on robotics, and I will go quickly to the needs and challenge we have on the use of this, uh, of this robot, okay? So mainly we need, we use robot, we need robot to inspect, operate and maintenance radioactive particle accelerators devices to increase maintainability, maintainability and availability, okay? So all our experimental areas uh, and objects are uh, in most of the case, not built to be remote handled or inspected. And any intervention we do may lead to a surprise and there is a risk of, uh, of contamination. So if you see this table, uh, and how uh, robots are important for the availability of particle accelerators. So if we imagine that we have uh, a constant reliability of a machine or our accelerator, what increases the availability is the increase of maintainability. So the efficiency of our uh, maintenance task. So this can be of course done uh, by humans. So we can uh, increase the, the efficiency of the maintenance tasks performed by human. Or this could be also uh, done with the use of robot or with the use of uh, robot in collaboration with, uh, with humans. But we don't have to forget that all the time we would like to deploy a robot in a tunnel, in an experimental area. We must be sure that we are not put the machine in danger, the robot in danger, and all the human that might collaborate with the robot. So all um, recovery scenarios also, uh, in case of failures, must be um, foreseen. Which are the main difficulties we find uh, to um, apply these robots? Uh, of course, we have radiation, magnetic disturbance. In most of the cases, the, the equipment is delicate and is not designed to be handled by a robot. We have big distances. Communication, we cannot have active electronic in the tunnel due to radiation. The time for the intervention is critical. We need to intervene uh, as quick as possible. And in most of the, the case, for some tasks also I'm going to show you, highly skilled technicians are uh, required. And most of the case, these are not non-robotic operators. So which robots, at least in our experience, are suitable for maintenance in our uh, facilities or in general the big science facilities? There is no single solution that could fulfill all our needs and we would need the mobility and manipulation capability. So first of all, we need to uh, deploy robots in a uh, confined area. This is a challenge. And we would like to have a fusion of different type of uh, robots. For example, the fusion of drones, snake robots, humanoids, um, flexible robots, for example. And let's say the fusion of this robot is not possible. So the idea we had at the time is to invest in modular robotics. So robots that can be adapted to different, to different facilities, to different scenarios. So now I'm going to introduce, I'm going to start to talk about uh, our robotic service. So what do we have in our, uh, in our robotic pool? This is a picture, an overview of all the robots, uh, of the robotic families we have in our, um, in our group. So on the left, there is Telemax and Tel these are industrial robots we use mainly for teleoperation. Then during the last year, we have the, the, um, developed the what is called team, the train inspection monorail, extreme robot. And on the right, you have the sandbot. This is um, also made uh, at sand by us, full, full control by us in different configuration. This is the idea of modularity. So with one, with one uh, type of uh, framework, you could build different 
configuration of robot, including, uh, for example, in the small picture here, uh, what we call crane bot. This is a set, the core of the same bot, put it upside down and connect to a crane. And also we have drones for uh, that supports the, the teleoperation. So what we do on this uh, on this robot, we do mechatronics conception designs, proof of contents, com, uh, proof of concept. Sorry, in most of the case, before deploying the robots or building them, we have to build prototypes, then series production. We operate them, maintains, and we build the tools a procedure around their um, around their use. So all these robots are used by us mainly for uh, environmental measurement, maintenance, inspection in radioactive areas, quality assurance. We do quite a lot of post-mortem analysis of radioactive uh, devices to understand the cause of failure. We do reconnaissance, search, search and rescue development with our uh, fire brigade colleagues and many, 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 many others. So I mentioned that we, we do operations. So we have uh, two low operators uh, that uh, deploy and operate uh, the robots. You see here some, uh, some pictures, but we also do uh, the controls of them. So we, in our embedded control, we do also all the immersive and forward cinem uh, cinematics, feedbacks, and of course the, the operation. To be able to build and to, to use this robot, of course, we need to test them. We have a couple of labs. One is uh, in building 937, where we do actually test all our controls, 3D printing, and where we also host uh, students for um, stage observation to, let's say, observation stage to introduce them to the technology of uh, robots, but in general, uh, to the mechatronics world. Um, then we have in 927, a mock-up of the LHC, approximately 30 meter of mock-up made in wood with some infrastructure, where we do um, testing of robot, we commissioning the robot, we test all the, the intervention procedures and the recovery scenarios. And also, this is important in this area. And then we have a virtual reality zone where we could simulate the, the intervention or the um, operation in, um, in virtual reality. In the past, we have, I mean, I've introduced you quite a lot of uh, custom-made robots and I mentioned control. Why we had, uh, the, in the past we decided to start some um, custom robotic development at CERN, mainly because we have a vast and different type of machines. We have unstructured environment and we find at the time that industrial solution were not fulfilling all our needs for remote maintenance and quality control. So I introduced already the, the needs for modular concept so we decided to uh, start, uh, let's say, to build both from design and control side, a robotic framework. Also, because you see here that uh, industrial robot most of the time comes with a very complicated human robot interface. So we decided at the time also to start to build an in-house human robot interface to connect to all our robots and to be able to operate all our robots in an homogeneous way. Okay. And one important aspect was the needs, is the needs to uh, having the human in the loop. So uh, all the feedbacks and having a possibility of uh, developing and use what we, we call a user-friendly interface, okay? With the goal to increase the proprioception, reducing the operator's test. Proprioception is the capability of uh, giving the, of allowing the operator to, to sense and feel the environment around itself and uh, himself or himself and the robot. That's why we start in the past, a framework that is, has been named CENTAU, this is for a scent and manipulation senatology unit for robotic operation. So the idea was to have a mechatronic system. So uh, that is composed by a motion part. So wheels or uh, feet, for example, an actuation part, you can imagine with the single arm or dual robotic arm and with artificial intelligence to be able to perceive and to take decision within an environment. So we start to develop a human robot interface, as I said, a new user-friendly bilateral teleoperation system with, the, in this case, a master arm, uh, a primary robot in the surface and a secondary robot in the tunnel, for example, included with haptic feedback and assisted teleoperation. And during the years, we um, integrate on this robot and the core of artificial intelligence to be able to increase perception and autonomy, also with the use of deep learning. 
And in the last years, we are introducing some um, operator and robot training system, also using learning by demonstration technique where the person can teach a robot how to do an action and then the robot can do in a pre-teached way this in the, in the tunnel, for example. This is an overview of the control system we are, uh, we are using to, to control and operate the robot. So on the left, we have a central operating system that connects with different modules, okay? that goes from the environmental mapping to the master control artificial intelligence. And on the right, there is a scheme uh, that summarizes quickly how the robots are uh, controlled, for example. So you have a robot on the field below. So this is a tunnel part. And the robot has all the intelligence that can uh, feel the environment and also the, the basic safety to guarantee that uh, nothing is uh, in danger. Then through a VPN, we are connecting the surface where we have the human robot interface. And the human robot device can connect to different type of what we call master device. So device that gives the inputs to the robot. That can be joypad, keyboard, uh, or uh, let's say another master arm. And then we can, with this human robot interface, we can see robots, the sensor, the tools. And we might have also a supervision part through another VPN where multi-clients can connect to an intervention. You can imagine that we can have some uh, supervision modules that can uh, supervise the intervention, the equipment or RP, for example, can uh, follow an operation thanks to this, uh, to this. And the controls allows two types of, uh, of basic, uh, let's say, uh, controls. So one is the unilateral. So where, for example, from a surface, you can imagine here there is Juma robot interface sending a command to a secondary robot or slave arm controller in the tunnel, okay? And the, the robot is uh, actually doing the, the action in tunnel in a unilateral way without feedbacks to the operator. This is an example of a Giacomo is, is trying to move, is moving a robotic arm uh, while he's being tracked by a tracking system. And so there is no feedback in his arm. He's just sending command to the, to the, to the arm, to the slave that is uh, fulfilling the task. And the second scheme is the bilateral control. This is another way how the, we can control our robot. So on the surface, you have always a master arm, but you also have a control where you receive force feedback, for example, or active feedbacks. And then the, the signals that are sent to the tunnel, to the slave arm are, let's say, um, pre uh, processed. So this is an, an example of a bilateral control. You have Carlos here that is operating two robotic master arm, and then the, the same bot with dual arm and dual robotic arms are doing the, the task. And in this case, for example, one can uh, have uh, haptic feedback in the master arm to, to be able to, to let the operator see and feel or uh, to give uh, the operator an experience of imitation uh, of what the robot is doing in the, in the tunnel. So I introduce haptics. Why haptics is very important in the in teleoperation. Um, one, uh, once we, we operate a robot, okay, um, you, don't know, you, you don't know the environment. So you don't know how strong is the robotic arm of the robot, how fast it can move because you are not seeing it from a third point of vision, how much impulse you can send to him, okay? And haptics or feedback, uh, force feedback, for example, haptics in general, and let us understand in the way how the robot is interfacing with the environment, okay? especially for uh, unstructured or unknown environment or semi-structure, we need to understand how much does, uh, for example, uh, an object that we are keeping from the ground weights, uh, does it break easily, for example? So haptics let us understanding the effect that an operator or the robot have on the environment. And most of the time where we intervene in telerobotics, we need to stay gentle while we are being strong. And this is, uh, looks contradictory, but this is what we need when we intervene. So this is an example of the Centauro controls and the um, haptic feedback or force feedback. You have Giacomo here that is, um, let's say, moving a master arm. You have to measure this on the tunnel side. And on the, oh, sorry, on the surface side, on the tunnel side, there is a, a slave arm with a needle that is touching a balloon. Believe me, the needle is very, is very tiny. So you see here is feeling the force of the needle contacting the balloon, so it's stopping, okay? And in the control, he can adjust the sensitivity of the, of the force feedback that he can have in the, in the master arm that is in hand. Now he has decreased sensitivity, 
So the, the, the master arm is not stopping him, for example, here to, to make the balloon explode. And then when I said before, we need to stay strong, but also gentle. And here is Zolt, for example, is showing how we could control a robotic arm in impedance mode. So we can tell the robot to be very strong, but the controllers allows us also to, 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 to manage a robotic arm in a gentle way. So here you can, you can imagine that this is perfectly suitable for uh, teleoperation where we need, for example, sewing task where we need to be strong or teleoperation where uh, we have to connect a fiber optic cable where we have to be very precise and, uh, and gentle. And here, so we now, yeah, we move now in uh, master sleeve control this uh, two, two types also of different arms. Say you have seven axis master arm moving a six axis uh, slave arm. So the control behind is managing all this uh, immerse, uh, direct and immerse uh, kinematics. I mentioned human robot interface. This is our uh, interface that we are using to control all our robots. So it's been built during the last, uh, the last years. I say it can, as I said, it, it, can, uh, inject, it can have as input different type of, uh, of uh, Input device like keyboards, joypad, the master arm. So we have done this because we have different operators, and sometimes for also depending on the task, an operator can choose different type of, of master device. Okay. There is a multi-screen capability. We have the operate the possibility that the operator trains with this human robot interface. This is an important aspect because training with the same tool that one is going to use in operation is really, really uh, effective. And thanks to all this development. What we can do during the last years, we can first do robotic for preventive maintenance, it means that we can intervene during uh, long shutdown, technical stops, yet these are pre planned interventions where we can, uh, let's say, prepare tools and procedures. So, these are some examples we have done during the last year, for example, to refill the OLS of the magnet kicker in the SPS or for uh, installing in ID targets some uh, temperature sensors on the, on the target side. But we are able also to intervene in uh, short notice. So we are able to intervene in less than two hours in case of needs, in emergency need. For example, we have been uh, called the ISO day several times as Sean. Uh, in case there is an intervention, inspection, or operation, we might uh, intervene uh, quick. And I mentioned before post mortem. It's very important to do post mortem because to understand also the cause of failure uh, for new design. So we have done quite a lot of. Uh, teleoperation maintenance task of devices that have been pulled out from the tunnel to understand and save the cause of, uh, of failures. You can imagine how it's important design phase of a machine because we are intervening on most of the machines that are not uh, robot friendly. They, are, they have not been designed to have interfaces that are easy handleable by robot. So for the future, we are uh, talking also with the equipment owner, putting an accent of improving the new design of a machine to be robot friendly or uh, remote maintenance uh, friendly. Because you can imagine if an interface, for example, on the right is uh, plug and play, so it's relatively easy to be uh, handled by a robot uh, remotely. Another important task in the use of robot is the use of uh, efficient procedure and tools. I always say that intervention procedure, recovery and tools are as important as the robot that is doing the intervention. So you cannot imagine to have uh, multi-redundant arms or robotic arms making all the tasks without the right tools, so interfaces in between the robotic arms and the machines, and without the right, without procedure. And we are keeping strong an accent on the standardization of interfaces because standardizing tools and procedure will reduce costs and intervention time for the future. You will have more on this on the Friday lecture of Luca regarding um, procedures and tools. So this is an overview of the robot. We are the main robots we have installed in the machine within our machine. So I mentioned before team the train inspection monitor, we have four units in the LHC. This is a compact uh, train. It's a compact robot, uh, 30 by 37 centimeter section that is operating mainly in the LHC to do uh, radio protection measurements. So um, as a measuring of radiation at the beam height during different type of the during different periods in different part of the of the run. But we also during the last year installed 
different robots like the SPS robots that is now under commissioning in the SPS. So it's, it's a compact robot that is doing ghost rider protection measurement. It's compact because it has to pass the sector door, the newly uh, hole uh, open in the SPS sector door that have an aperture only of 400 by 200 millimeter. We also in, in build a robot for Sham and in collaboration with handling group, we are controlling the big three KUKA robots that are managing the targets at the Isolde and, uh, and Medicis. Regarding team, in the last, we have developed a new, uh, what we call robotic wagon. So it's a wagon equipped with the six degree of freedom arm plus five axes more to let uh, the robotic, uh, let's say arm taking a radioactive source within a shielding that has been also built, uh, built by us, they were designed and built by us to let this, radio, um, this radiation source reaching the proximity of the BLMs to trigger their, uh, their signal. We have some videos of, here of uh, the operation done during this uh, LS. And coming back to modular robots, I mentioned before Sandbot, this is um, a bit more in details. It's a fully custom Sand robot that we are using everywhere now in different configurations. You see single arm here on the left, dual arm. We have a lifting stage where you can put two arms on top, different also arm technologies. And the small version of this Sandbot have been uh, installed, as I mentioned before in the SPS. And then we also have a version that can be connected to, to a crane. Modular controls, why they are important. I like to show this, this picture because this is an industrial robot, Theodore, what is called, with many, many degree of freedom where we have integrated an industrial robot on top to be able to, to uh, teleoperate in the um, BDF uh, test end or two years ago, uh, yes, two or three years ago, I forgot. Precisely there, but this is uh, actually the, the result of why uh, modular robots and modular controls are important because it gives us the flexibility to intervene in a bunker like this with a ground industrial robots that can bring in a confined space like the BDF, uh, the beam dump facility bunker here, a six axis robotic arm to do dexterous and fine tail operation. I'm going to quickly introduce an answer reality, but you will have more of this on Christophe lecture um, during this week. We are using uh, an answer reality or uh, virtual reality to improve uh, simulation of robotic and human intervention. So in virtual reality, you might have uh, sim to simulate a real task, and one can also have a fluca um, radiation simulated inside to estimate the radiation dose taken by a person during uh, an intervention. These slides resume quickly the, the robotic intervention performed from 2014. We have done in the tunnel approximately 150 intervention uh, in tunnel experimental areas doing approximately 500 tasks. And we have operated this robot for approximately 500 hours. And all these tasks really were all different. So the type of intervention we do is telemanipulation, mainly radiation survey, and for the 47%, we do reconnaissance and visual inspection. Regarding telemanipulation tasks, we do tasks like screwing, grasping, sewing, or cutting. And as um, feedback and return of experience on this uh, operation, we are uh, continuing developing best practice for equipment design and robotic intervention procedures and tools, including uh, recovery scenarios. This is a plot that summarizes the number of intervention in the tunnel from 2014 until today. And then you see here, at the end of 2014, we start to apply our custom modular uh, in-house development. And you see here from this period, how then the maintenance capability and the number of interventions have increased during, uh, during the last years. So we are using this robot also to try to to, to use them for a search and rescue, for example, or the intervention we are collaborating with uh, our fire brigade colleagues in to see if we could use for the future also these robots to uh, support their intervention. And we developed over the last year a module that is composed by a radar, a 3D camera, thermal camera, and a, and a laser scanner. Try to see if we might, if we can see people in tunnel, recognize them, and without content tracking their uh, health rate. So we, we are able to understand if a person is lying on the ground and how is uh, breathing. So to give feedback to the fire brigade in advance where a person is located and which is the, the health status. 
And the follow-up of this project is what the project is been named Marquese that uh, aims to, to use the same technology to so monitoring of health, the, um, of the health of the person at distance using machine learning. But in this case, Roberto is uh, developing a system only with using a 2D camera that only monitoring a phase of the person is able to, uh, let's say, um, estimate the breathing and uh, the heartbeat of the, of the person. This is used for, uh, for medical application. And also we're using robot, we are capable of, um, let's say, inspecting and understanding the condition of uh, an infrastructure of the tunnel, for example. So we can endorse our robot with the high definition camera taking pictures and understanding the condition of the tunnel along the years. And this is a uh, project that we are running in collaboration with our civil engineer colleagues, where we have also for Adum LFC uh, surveyed the existing infrastructure using uh, robots. We have done a sort of picture, uh, no, sorry, we have done a series of pictures, sorry, understanding the status of the tunnel and also monitoring the current cracks in the, in the world using machine learning. Another, uh, let's say, technology we developed during the last year is the capabilities of using robotic arms, in this case, big hook arm, hook arm robots, to do milling uh, machining process. Here, for example, uh, there is um, all the design and application of a milling tool to manufacture, in this specific case, stainless steel, but we can manufacture aluminum, iron, and different type of material. And on the right, you have this uh, video of thermal camera that shows how the temperature and also the, um, the dry cut is under control. We are not reaching, uh, let's say, temperature more than 50 degrees. And this is very important when we do want to open, let's say, or cut um, machine to do post-mortem analysis. Um, after the use. Another robot that has been realized by us in the last year is um, an inspection, a robot, that, a robot that can inspect um, RF cavities. Uh, so we have developed all the mechatronic concept, the robotic arm the, that is inserting a camera inside a 78 millimeter aperture of the, of the cavity to uh, safely inspect using a vision system, an example of a picture that we are able to take now at 23 millimeter distance from a surface to uh, find, uh, say, anomalies within this, uh, these cavities. Another uh, also sample exchanger we have developed is for uh, in collaboration is for, for our RP colleague to do spectrography analysis, to so insert, let's say, to manage, to handle uh, samples taken out from the tunnel and to insert them inside the um, spectrum photographic um, detector. So we have done all the development here of the mechatronic device and the control of the industrial robotic arm. So I'm finishing here the quick review of our uh, robotic service. And I would like to, to share with you some videos mainly of some challenging robotic missions we have done over the last, um, over the last year. I've chosen uh, some of them. And I would like to start with the ones that we have done in 2015 using uh, two industrial robots and two operators. This has been the handling of some radioactive sources in the old dosimeter calibration uh, hole in building 172. This is only one, the video of only one um, source uh, handled. So the source were installed at the end of this um, support, this rod. So with these two robots, we have, let's say, taken out from the, from the ground this source, putting in the, on the, let's say, uh, mechanical uh, stage to be able to cut the rod only outside. So here I want to put the accent on procedure and tools. So these are standard tools that you can find in any garage. And, uh, but these tools and procedures have been, have been adapted to the use of two robots. So this is how we were using the robot at the time. And uh, so this is standard uh, teleoperation and uh, let's say common use of, uh, the use of common tools that we have, uh, let's say, all in our guys. So then the, the, of course the sample have been put in the transport viewer and, uh, but also the way how we close the door, it's all mimicking, let's say human uh, action or human, uh, human behavior using, using the robots in this case. The second uh, intervention I would like to share with you is the handling of the radioactive source for the ATRAP experiments uh, done in the past. So we had to uh, handle you using, uh, in this case, we use SAMBOT with the lifting stage and the dual robotic arm. We have two different arms here, a Kinova arm for fine operation and a Shunk arm 
for more strong operators. So we had to design tools and to handle this type of very fine, very uh, small radioactive source to be able to be installed in a beam line. So you see here how precise we had to put uh, this source inside the ATRAP beam line eddy, and then with all the screwing, uh, inserting, and handling of the small uh, screws uh, and, uh, and nuts. And we had installed, but also we had to recuperate the, the radioactive uh, samples uh, after the radiation. So this has been also fully done by us using robots, different tools, different grippers. You see here the gripper is different. The two fingers are different. So you have a, a screw on, um, on the left and uh, a fingertip on the right. But also here different procedure and different uh, techniques. Another intervention I would like to share has been the inspection of the old LHC TD. Uh, so this is the old uh, main dump of the LHC. There had been a nitrogen leak at the time. So we had to inspect the downstream flange. We have been asked by our STI colleagues to inspect the downstream flanges of this, um, of this dump. So to prepare, we have used uh, visual reality uh, simulation also to show that uh, we knew already, but this is to make uh, to show how uh, visual reality can be can be uh, used to estimate radiation taken by human. And then we have used visual reality to simulate the robotic intervention and to choose the robot that needed to intervene at the time. So we have also used um, um, learning by demonstration to teach the robot and to simulate all the action we needed to do in this. Uh, in this place. Now, at the end, we decided to use the crane bot. So, this is our uh, sandbot part. Put it upside down and connect to the crane. So, with the handling group colleague, we have performed this uh, intervention with a dual arm. So, we have uh, lowered down the, the crane mount into the LHCT, the uh, downstream flange environment. And now we had done all the inspection. So, you can imagine here we have full of uh, sensor RP sensors. Uh, cameras, of course, 3D cameras, proximity sensor. We have measured also the level of oxygen all uh, all around this uh, downstream um, this downstream flange. Another intervention I would like to show has been the support we have done to the STI group for the cutting of the tubes uh, for the dismounting of the old end of target. So we have used here Theodore and Sambot equipped with the with the cutting tool. Here how. We have, we, have, we have been able to cut the tubes and to handle with the robot uh, the cutted part for, uh, let's say, storage and, uh, and disposal. And here, the uh, last video I would like to share with you is the um, dismantling we done of the old TIDVG in the SPS using also in this case two robots. So this is Telemax, and uh, on the left and on the right, it is assembled with the Shunkar. But on this, on this intervention, we also have done uh, quite a lot of, I will go quickly here, post-mortem analysis in a bunker. So we are using this case, Theodore and the Sambot to uh, open the shell of the old um, TIDVG. So here sometimes with standard tools uh, that the human also might use, uh, some rod to, to be able to open and to guide then uh, the next crossing. And then with the with the same body, you will see we have done with many sensors sniffing also. Uh, with the high HD camera sniffing helium, we have found uh, in collaboration with the Vacuum group colleagues the where uh, the leak have been and also the cause of failure have been uh, found. So I will close. I close here the this list of of uh, let's say many intervention I want to share. And I will introduce you uh, the main future objectives we have for our uh, robotic uh, team, let's say. First, we need to uh, finalize the, um, the crane bot that is going to be used for the VAX remote maintenance, CMS, for example. You have uh, here a video with some picture of tests we have done during LS, where uh, with the help of handling group and with the crane bot, we have done a first proof of concept of the installation of the VAX module in, uh, in CMS. But also another challenge uh, task will be in collaboration with the SCI group, the opening of the old uh, um, end of target with the same milling uh, technology uh, that I have introduced before. In this case, with the two arms, one KUKA is doing the cut, another one with the vacuum uh, tool is taking uh, safely the cutted part, is sucking safely the, the cutted part. And another challenge would be the finalization of the data seeding uh, 
milling uh, technique uh, using also this CSC uh, robotic uh, techniques to be done also uh, at CERN during uh, LS3. In collaboration with the fire brigade, we started uh, an R&D on the use of uh, the robot to, to intervene and to help them to intervene in case of uh, danger, in case of fire, for example. We've done some, uh, some tests with them in their mock-up um, here in Prevesan using the same bot equipped with the, um, the perception devices I showed you before to localize a fire, for example, to measure the temperature and to give to fire brigade information before their intervention. Here I put a video comparing an, an intervention done in a smoke environment with the robot equipped with only a 2D image on the left and on the right with the infrared camera and, um, and thermal camera. So you can see here on the right, you, the, the system on the right is capable, is capable of finding Luca much before the, the one or, or with, the, let's say, the 2D. You see here, Luca is much more visible before on the right and on the left. And also with the techniques I showed you before uh, of um, monitoring uh, without contact, the health of a person at distance, we can estimate the, the heartbeat and the breathing uh, rate of a person. Also, we would like to uh, continue investing in uh, adaptive traction system for modular robots. For example, we would like to equip Sambot with a with the tracking system so that, is, uh, that the robot is able to, to do stairs. We would like to continue using drones and the snake robot to inspect uh, confined spaces. And also we would like to improve the autonomy of what I've shown or the intervention I've shown also continuing using uh, machine learning. And in the future, we would like also to, uh, I've shown you before the video of, uh, of uh, Carlos, we would like to continue endorsing the operator with haptic feedbacks to increase uh, the proprioception and also to continue using learning by demonstration. Uh, you have a couple of videos here explaining the system where a person can teach a robot how to do an action. You have on the right, Santiago that is teaching um, for a polishing action, a robotic, uh, a robotic arm. And then the robot, in a teacher way, can do this uh, polishing task, uh, let's say, uh, without a human intervention. Also, I've uh, introduced you the um, operation we have done during LS using the team for the BLM validation. For the future, we would like to, to make this um, type of, uh, let's say, teleoperation in the tunnel in the let's see as much as autonomous as possible. So we are working on a system that is capable of recognize using machine learning a six degree of freedom of the beam loss monitor within the tunnel. So once we know the six degree of freedom of the BLM in a precise way, we know the Cartesian of the robot, then it's relatively straightforward to, let's say, uh, do this type of action in an autonomous way. Of course, we end up anti-collision system. We are also working on what we call Team Junior. It's a small version of Sembot that is capable of entering a team wagon. So this is a robot that has to be less than 25 centimeter width and has to be able to be integrated in, in, in robotic uh, in the team robotic wagon and has to be lowered down from the wagon to the ground. And we have uh, done now a prototype that is uh, under, uh, under commission. We are also working for the robot for the future accelerator for FCC, for example. You will have more uh, on this on Hannes' uh, lecture this week. So which robot we are going to use for FCC can be inspired by human, can be inspired by animals, for example, can be a quadruped. We still don't know, but Hannes is hardly working on this. So he's uh, actually designing a system that is capable of uh, moving around the FCC accelerator and uh, for, for the moment, um, he's concentrating on tasks like inspection and, uh, and telemanipulation. But again, he will talk more about this in his lecture also regarding the design of this robot, the control of this robot, and all the challenges that he's, um, he's facing. Regarding this work, and thanks also to this work, an important aspect is that we are, as CERN, we are chairing the EU robotics teleoperation topic group. This is um, a very important consortium. It's the most important consortium in Europe for teleoperation. So we are in this also because we are following the R&D of uh, in, uh, in Europe uh, regarding robotics. And thanks also to this work, we have built a lot of, um, let's say, consortium with the uh, industry, 
uh, research centers in uh, Europe for uh, European, uh, European projects. So to conclude, so particle accelerators are uh, installed normally for many years and uh, tasks like uh, dismantling radioactive object will be inherited by our future colleagues, by future generation of uh, physicists, technicians, and engineers. So that's why uh, we have to focus on uh, the fact that uh, maintenance and dismantling tasks over the entire life cycle of uh, an accelerator must be taken into account at design phase. This is very important. So we also have experienced that ro robotic intelligence and robot system, of course, can increase uh, our safety, our and uh, our colleague safety and the machine availability in performing maintenance tasks. Ready to use industrial solutions, so things that we can buy and use immediately in the tunnel uh, with, of course, a user-friendly interface without an extreme and tedious training is not existing. During the last year, I can say we gained an important experience in the design and uh, use, produce uh, and apply robot in our environment that in general is uh, harsh and hazardous. And, hazardous. and what is important for us is the fact that uh, we collaborate with the Robotic Research Center University also to take advantages of uh, cutting edge technology. So what's going on also to understand what's going on out there. So I would like to, to finish leaving you with a question. So uh, I've read an article that uh, we're saying that robots are serving us also nowadays. So they are cooking for us, they are cleaning uh, the houses. Yes, I agree on one side, but are we sure that we are not serving robots, at least on what we are doing in our daily, daily life? So robots needs maintenance, robot needs to be commissioned in the tunnel, robot needs to be handled, to be decontaminated. Uh, so robots needs many people uh, around them and needs instrumentation and crew and helps as so expert in-house to be uh, able to be uh, deployed in an efficient way. And the work I've, I've, um, I've shown is uh, it's done thanks to many, many colleagues that have been working uh, with us during the last years, lots of students, and uh, thanks also to lots of collaborations we have uh, with many institutes around, around the world. So I leave also some reference for this, and thanks a lot for, uh, for your attention. Thanks a lot, Mario. Extremely impressive and inspiring. Thank you. Are there questions or comments for Mario? I, okay, while waiting uh, perhaps uh, uh, for questions, I have one, Mario. Um, in the LEC, we have the famous ping pong ball that is used to inspect the aperture. Um, have you ever considered the possibility of replacing this by a robot, moving inside the, the beam aperture to inspect whether there are RF fingers back inside? For the, for the specific task, uh, no, but with the vacuum group, we are since uh, three, four years discussing on uh, which system might be suitable to inspect beam pipe. Of course, there are constraints because beam pipes are the, internally are not uh, always the, they are not always the same path. There are fingers as you as you you mentioned, but we are uh, discussing together if in the future we might use uh, one of these uh, robotic solution to inspect uh, beam pipes, but not for the specific let's say other finger problem. Is the the the, the low temperature that we have in the beam pipe uh, pipe uh, a potential? difficulty for a robot yes this is uh, actually one difficulty and uh, of course at 1.9 <laughs> it's much more challenged that but we were um, we were, we were discussing if we we might warm up a bit to uh, levels like uh, 80 or 100k kelvin sorry where uh, let's say solution might be uh, applied but of course uh, building let's say electronics motion system uh, at such temperature is challenging. Okay. Um, there is a question in the chat uh, about slide uh, 47. Why no use of Ross uh, in CERN robot? Okay, I go to 47, but yes, Ross, 
once we were uh, the time when we started the the control system choice let's say we didn't use ROS because uh, we wanted to go for uh, real-time capabilities okay so our our control is uh, like 246 our control is able to to run on real-time platform while ROS is not this is one of uh, was one of the decision point another one is that ROS has a strong and heavy package uh, I will arrive there 47 47, 47. 47. Yes, Ross has, uh, has um, let's say, the needs of uh, installing many, many libraries and packages are quite uh, heavy. So when we talk about robot on the field, we would like to have, uh, let's say, the possibility of running also on uh, standard, uh, I mean, NUC, not high or super performance processor. So we had done some, some tests at the time where uh, I mean, Ross was not performing as we, were, we expected. But the main decision point was the real-time um, option that is not available on ROS. There is a work running now on ROS2 or industrial ROS that is much more advanced. And most probably, we are going to use the communication part of ROS, uh, or at least to compare with our communication uh, li libraries to see if uh, we might, uh, let's say, uh, be better using ROS with respect to what we are currently using now. ROS is the robotic operation system effort. Mm -hmm. It is the, the most robotic operation system used around the world, used by universities, by any research center. But in, if you go in places where robots are used, like us, DLR, nuclear facilities, ROS is not used. Okay, thanks a so lot, Mario. Also, thanks from the people who raised the point. Rahim, please go ahead with your question. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was quite enlightening. I have a small question. Um, so in some of the early... Uh, wait, I, at least I lost you. Uh, I also lost you, Rahim. Rahim, we are going to wait until you reconnect. There was also um, a question concerning the possibility of doing interns uh, on this topic. We have, uh, yeah, we, we, do, we, we host uh, many, many interns, observation stage, stagiaire. We have all the possible programs. So we have, uh, let's say, there is this possibility. We have, uh, as I showed you before, that we, have, uh, we are in the HSIP and the official Italian teacher programs. Uh, where we host uh, students or trainees uh, very often. So then the message, I guess, is uh, if you are interested uh, in this, uh, please contact Mario directly. Okay, very good. Um, so Mario, uh, Raim indeed uh, typed in the, the question in the chat. So the question is, you explain how humans uh, moving the robots can also teach them. What type of software are you using to do that? Is it some kind of machine learning? If so, which one? If you can mention it, of course. Yes, I can redirect immediately to the Christoph lecture, but yeah, we are, we are using mainly PyTorch or uh, let's say um, machine learning uh, framework that are uh, out there. And uh, we are not developing a neural network. So we are adapting, we are using deep learning, uh, testing there, but we are not at the, um, at the point where we are, let's say, uh, developing or, uh, let's say, adapting a neural network. But you will have much more on this on the Christoph uh, lecture. Okay. Thank you, Mario. Are there any, any other questions or comments for Mario? Okay. So if not, I propose we break here. Thanks a lot again, Mario, for, for, for your presentation. It was really excellent. We're looking forward to, to the other four. And um, so thanks a lot to all people attending this uh, lecture today. I'm looking forward to see you again virtually tomorrow in the other days. Uh, we break here and uh, have a nice lunch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.